Uh, welcome to the first workshop for our web coding series here at the Digital Lounge. Welcome. We are going to go through, oh, if this stops being a little wonky. Um, so we have three workshops planned. So today we're going to go through this uh, first one, HTML. Then next week we're going to jump into CSS. And the third one, we're going to do some more intermediate CSS stuff and a very brief introduction to JavaScript. Um, don't worry if you don't know what any of that means. I will explain what all of those mean in just a moment. Um, but first, I want to talk a little bit about some kind of terms that you might hear uh, when you start developing for the web, just in case if you are researching stuff up and you see a name and you're like, I don't know what that means. This is uh, just four basic things to know. The first is that any sort of computer that is trying to access a website, whether it be a laptop, a phone, um, a desktop computer, that's what we call the client. And then the server is where your website is actually like lives, right? So servers are basically just all other computers. They just host a bunch of files. And so when you type in like annenberg.usc.edu into your browser, what's happening is that the browser is connecting to the server and saying, hey, someone's asking for the Annenberg website. Can you give me those files so I can display it to them? And that's what just happened in that like one-ish second that it took to load um, this entire website. Then there's the concept of a domain name. So this is going to be that name that you put into your browser. So annenberg.usc.edu is the domain name for this. And this is essentially a unique identifier for users to access a specific website. You can't have, like, I couldn't go and buy annenberg.usc.edu because someone's already using it. You can't have multiple um, websites with the same domain name. So as you are starting to publish your content to the web, you may need to um, buy a domain name if you want something custom like, you know, yourname.com, for example. And then hosting is the concept of paying for this service to put your website on a server. So in order for people to actually see your site, you will need to put it on a server. And to do that, you need to set up a hosting plan. Uh, GoDaddy does this, Bluehost. Uh, there's a variety of different options. Um, at the end of the third workshop, I will show you a way that you can put it up for free. Um, but a lot of them are paid. So just a um, brief little overview of some terms that you might run into as you are starting to do some coding for the web. And today, we're going to go through HTML. And it looks a little something like this image right here, but we'll play around with it more and actually write some code today. And HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. The hypertext part is essentially just links. <laughs> so when you are at a certain website, hypertext would be like this more news where I could click on there and it takes me to another HTML page. Every page on this website including graduate applicants, faculty and staff resources. These are all different HTML uh, files. So for each page that you want to create on your website, you have to create a separate HTML page. The markup language is just essentially like if you've ever like turned in an essay and your like professor like writes in like red pen, like capitalize this or change this. That's essentially what markup is. It's just um, a specific way that you're writing the content that's actually telling the browser how you want it to be displayed. HTML is the standard language for creating web pages. It's where you start. Um, if you take any sort of web development or web coding kind of boot camp or course, you start with HTML. It's the most basic, it's the easiest to understand, and it's how you actually put text and images and how you organize content on your site, which is the structure of a web page. And then it's paired with CSS and JavaScript, which is what we'll be going through in the next two weeks. CSS is the coding language that is used to style your site. So you are going to see as we write our HTML code today that when we preview our site, it is going to look very um, boring and not great. And that's because by default, HTML has very basic styling. And then CSS, which we are going to start learning next week, is how you actually change the colors and the fonts and positioning the elements in different ways on your site. 
And then JavaScript is a little bit more intense. Uh, this is a programming language that is, you know, you could spend hours and hours and years and years mastering. And this is how you can add behavior to your site. So you can add some JavaScript that will be, hey, when you click this button on my site, it'll do this thing. That's essentially what JavaScript does. So now HTML is based on what are called elements. And these are the building blocks of HTML. Everything you write in HTML is going to be in this element. Um, I've made this diagram. It looks like a lot, but we're gonna break it down right now. So every HTML element has what's called a tag. And you write a tag by doing this kind of opening caret, some sort of tag name. In this case, it's the P, which is, stands for paragraph or body text. And then this closing um, caret over here. And that's like a very basic start tag. We'll do some, uh, you'll see some of those that are like that. You'll see some that have these additional features on it. So this is an attribute called class, and this is a value. And so if you want to add some like additional things to your HTML, or you will add an attribute and then assign it a value. And we'll go through when we are going through a bunch of different elements, what attributes you need, which ones you can add that you just maybe want to spice things up a little bit. So don't worry if you're like, <laughs> what do I do here yet? Then there's almost always an end tag, which is very similar to the start tag, where it's that opening caret, the tag name, and then the closing one, except the end tag has this forward slash. And essentially what this allows us to do is say to Google Chrome, Safari, whatever browser someone's accessing our site, hey, we have this content, display it as a paragraph text, and this is where it starts, and this is where it ends. So any code I write after this, the browser's not going to continually think it's a paragraph element. Same as before. Any code before this, unless if I also put those paragraph elements there, are not going to be what is called rendered as a paragraph. And so this is where that markup part of the markup language comes. This saying, hey, this content is a paragraph element. That's markup. It's telling Chrome. It's telling Safari. It's telling Firefox. This is how I want you to show this content. Now, I did say that not um, every element is going to have an end tag. There's a couple that you don't need one, but um, you'll encounter some of those as we start today. So cool. Let's. Um, get coding. So um, if you got the email that I sent this morning, I did say that you'll need a code editor for your site. And I use what's called the Visual Studio Code. Let me try to get back to the welcome screen. Mine might look a little different. If you want to open up Visual Studio Code, I want to show you a little bit of how this looks. And let me see if I can make mine bigger. There we go. So um, Visual Studio Code is one of many different code editors out there. You might have also heard of Sublime Text or Atom. Macs have a default one called Text Edit. Um, Windows ones have a default one called Notepad. I think the default ones are kind of bad. So this is a free one. It has some really cool features that you'll see. The first thing that we have is over here on our left, we have a couple different tabs. The first is Explorer which is going to be essentially like our finder in Mac. It's also going to be like if you have File Explorer on Windows. This is going to be when we open up our project. This is how we're going to see um, different files and folders. Mine shows that I have something open. I'll show you how to open something in a bit. But as we start working on our project, this is how we're going to be able to see everything that's in this folder that we're going to create. There's also a search features. So similar to like Excel or Word, if you need to search and replace something in your code, you can do that as well. An example is maybe you've like coded a site for a club or a company and they're like, hey, that's great. But that green you used, we don't like, can you change it to this green? Instead of having to go and change that on each line of code that you wrote that green, you can do this search and replace to do it all at once. The third one is source control. Um, this is going to be a little more advanced. This is kind of outside of the realm of what we're going to be doing. Uh, if you are going to be working with multiple different people who are all going to be writing code, you might want to consider learning um, Git, which is a version source control. 
you essentially can break off your code and have like your website still run and still work, but you're playing around with code and then like kind of merge it back in and then see all those changes instead of trying to like take down your whole site just to fix something. It also helps if you're working with multiple people so that you're not messing up their code, they're not messing up your code and stuff like that. But we're not gonna go through that this uh, workshop series. There's also a, a run and debugger if you want to practice um, how you can like do some automation with debugging your code instead of opening it up and being like, why is everything not like I thought it was gonna be? And then there's extensions. And extensions are essentially features that are developed that you can add on to your VS code. And this allows you to do some additional things. The one that I would like you to install is called Live Server. And it looks like this, it has this kind of like purple icon, Wick Day, and there'll be an install button. And what this is going to allow us to do is to open up our website as if we published it already so that we can see the changes that we're making, that we can see how things are looking. This is going to be especially helpful next week as we start adding styling um, to our website. All right. Any questions about like basic VS Code stuff? Yeah. No, you can just go through that. Uh, you may notice that my like color scheme is a slightly different than yours probably. Um, if you want to play around with your color scheme, you can just click on code and then under settings, there's theme and then color theme and this you can like play around with themes that just show different colors you can find whatever one you like um, you don't have to use the same one that i'm doing this is just personal preference cool so one last thing that we should do before we start learning some html so if you open up your finder or your file explorer create a new folder if you're on finder you can just do a file new folder um, place this somewhere, your desktop, your documents, wherever you want. I have my Spring 24 web coding. You can name it whatever you want. And inside there, I have all of my assets that I'm going to use. So in the email that I sent out, I had a bunch of pictures and videos and audio and, and whatnot. Um, these are all of those things that I sent out. Um, you don't have to break it down into audio, documents, images, logos like I did. Sorry, the screen is so blurry right now, but that's just how I did to be a little bit more organized. Yeah, just make sure that you have whatever assets that you want to play around with, um, images, files, videos in a folder, or just in your overall Spring 24 web coding folder, your project folder. All right, give you a minute to do that. If, um, I mean, I provided just these as a sample, but if you have your own images, you can use them. Pretty standard for um, images is like JPEG or PNG videos, MP4, audio is MP3. It doesn't really matter. There are some file formats that aren't supported by browsers. Um, and you can find those if you go to like w3schools.com. And then if I were to go to, I'm just going to look up image. Each of those will have, uh, where is it? I know they have it for the video one. Um, but essentially they'll say like which um, files are or file formats are supported by which browsers. So for example, there's one called OGG. This one is not supported on Safari, for example. Cool. So now you want to open up this folder into VS Code. And you can do this by in your um, taskbar at the very top by clicking file and then open folder and then finding that folder that you created with all of your stuff. And so now you see in my Explore tab over here, I see that name of the folder I created. I see my assets. I can see all of these different things. The nice thing about VS Code is it gives you these little images that show you what type of content it is. And now let's click this new file on this welcome page. You can also um, hover over that folder name and then click the plus icon right here where it says new file. And mine's going in the audio, which I'm going to move and name it index.html. Now, most of the time I'll say you can name it whatever, you can do whatever, but it is always important to have one HTML file called index. And the reason why is browsers like Chrome and Firefox and Safari, when they're trying to determine which page to show as your homepage, they're looking for something called index.html. 
And so ensure that whatever um, homepage you have, you have it as index.html. So now that you have that created, it should open up this thing on the right where you can start writing some code like this. Now we are almost to the part of adding actual content, but there are some additional important things that you want to do when you first start um, writing some HTML code. And the very first thing is what we call a doc type declaration. And this goes a little bit further. You know, we have index.html, which tells Chrome, Safari that this is our homepage. But then for each HTML file, you want to include this declaration to say what version of HTML you're using. HTML was created like years and years ago, and it's gone under um, several major revisions. And so some sites are still using an outdated one, but you want to tell it, hey, we're using the most recent one. And how you do that is type in that opening caret. And this is why I love VS Code and not those default ones, is it'll give you some options that you can already pick from. And it is this top one. So it's exclamation points and then in all caps, D-O-C-T-Y-P-E. And then you're going to do a space. And then in all undercase, you're going to type HTML. If you're going to do um, an older version, you would do HTML4, HTML3. HTML5 is the most recent one, but you don't need to include the 5 because browsers know if you're just saying HTML, it means HTML5. And then close it off with that closing uh, bracket. All right, now press enter, and then we need to do one last thing, and that is do another opening caret, and then in all undercase, do HTML. Now, this is slightly different. If you notice when I closed it, it did give me my closing tag. Another great feature of VS Code is it knows when you need a closing tag and when you don't, and it'll automatically add it for you. So this is the HTML tag, and everything within this, we are telling the... Um, browser to render this as code. So we are telling the browser, all of this is our HTML code. And we know that it's going to be displayed how we want it to be. And there's two sections within here that we want to include. The first is if you do open and then head, H-E-A-D. It's called the head section, also known as the metadata section. Most of the stuff you put in here is not going to be shown to the user, um, except for two things that I will show you how to do. But this is where you can link to a CSS style sheet. This is where you can add like SEO keywords to your site. Uh, this is how you can kind of set your site up to kind of work on the back end a little bit more properly. And then underneath that, so if you go to the very end and press enter, do a body section as well. So that's opening carrot, body, closing. And this is the one that we're going to write all of the code that we want to show on our site. OK, so we've done this. I'm going to show you a really quick way to do it in VS Code, though. Uh, you don't have to follow along if you don't want. But if I delete all of that, and I do a just an exclamation point, and then I press Enter, it's going to enter in all of this stuff um, for me automatically. And there's some additional stuff that are added here that we are going to go through right now. The first is, remember how I said that you could do attributes and values? You can add one to your HTML tag called lang, and this says the language of your site. Um, so this one is en for English. Um, if you're going to write a site that has multiple different um, languages, it's pretty important to include what language each page is written in. And then these are some of those things that are not really displayed in the site. So this first one is the character set. There's different character encoding things. Um, UTF-8 is the most standard. It's just basically our, our normal characters we see on a screen. And then this next one allows you to kind of tell the browser, hey, when someone's visiting my site, try to display it based on the screen that they're using. So in this one, name is viewport. The viewport is essentially the, the size of the screen. So like my laptop screen is my viewport. If you're looking at it on a phone, that's the viewport. Then this content thing says width, look at the device width. So when I'm saying like, hey, do 100% of the width for this image, I want to make it full screen, full size. This is saying, hey, if they're using a phone, kind of shrink it down to look at their um, phone size as the full width. If they're using a laptop, you're looking at the laptop screen. 
And then initial scale is this one that is how zoomed in by default it should be. So if you wanted to do something really like different of like it's really zoomed in and then it like kind of fades back into like a normal size, you could change this, but most people are going to leave it like this. And then this last one is the title. And this is actually one that will be displayed to the user. So as you're browsing the web, you might notice that as you change pages, the name in this browser tab changes as well. So if I'm on academics, it says that. If I'm in admissions, it says USC Annenberg admissions. And that's exactly what this title tag changes. So I am going to rename this by editing the code between my title tags and saying like my like portfolio, let's say. You can name it whatever you want. But so this opening tag and this closing tag tells the browser, hey, this is the text I want you to show in that browser tab. Yes. In VS Code, if you do one exclamation point and then you enter, it'll do all of it for you. That's just as you start typing. Yes. You would just tap. So if I was, I could like open and I'd say, oh, maybe I'm going to do an audio and I could just tab and put it in. Or you can just click there. Cool. So I'm going to show you one last thing in this head section that will actually show up on the uh, screen. And that is how do you change this icon in the browser tab as well? That shows up right there. So we do this with a new um, element called link. So if you open, you type in L-I-N-K. And now we're going to get some practice putting in some attributes. So after the K, if you press a space and then type in R-E-L, and this stands for relationship. And so this is saying like, hey, we're, we're going to link something and I'm going to tell you the type of content that we're linking. So you're going to do R-E-L equals. And then with VS Code, it automatically added my quotations for me. If your code editor didn't, you'll need to add them on your own. And just type an icon in between these quotes. And then at the end of that, I'm going to put a space. I'm going to put in another attribute called type, T-Y-P-E equals, and then in quotes, I'm going to put image forward slash X hyphen icon. And this is saying, hey, we're going to put an icon in there. And this is specifying specifically the icon in our browser tab. And one last attribute that we have to add is the uh, file path to that actual icon that we want to use. And so at the end, put another space. And we're going to use what's called the href. So href. And this is essentially the URL for any hyperlink. As we start adding links to our site that's going to take us to other pages, we would put that in this href attribute. And there's a bunch of different ways that you can add file paths to HTML. The first is what's called an absolute file path. And this is going to be a little bit harder as we haven't published our, our content. But if you've ever done something like go to a website and like find an image and you like control click and do like a or right here and the copy link address, if I were to take that and post that in VS Code, for example, you'll see that it shows the full file path right here of where that link is. That is one way to do it. Um, it can be a little hard as you're starting to write code of like, I don't know where it is actually going to be living. I don't know what my domain name is going to be yet. And so what you can do is use what's called a relative file path. And this allows you to set the relationship between this current HTML document and where that image is living. So to do that, enter in a period and then a forward slash. And you can see that VS Code is seeing that, oh, I am going into the same folder. So that period forward slash means look in this spring 24 web coding folder, which is where my index.html file is. If I were to put my index.html file in my video folder, for example, and I did period forward slash, it's going to look in my video folder. And so if you put yours in a... Um, folder further down, you can do period, period, slash, and it'll go one behind. 
So now it's saying, hey, I know that I'm in the Spring 24 web coding folder. Go to wherever that folder is within. And in this case, it's my desktop. And I only have these three things on my desktop. So then I can just click through. I'm going to do assets, logos, and I have this browser favicon PNG. And that's the one that I uh, sent in that email. Another way to get there is if it's already in this explorer. And let's say I go to my logos and I can see it right here. If I control click or right click on there, there will be this copy path and copy relative path as well. So if you don't remember how to use these file paths and the relative ones, you can just always control click on the actual file in your Explorer and then copy the path or relative path and put that in. And then make sure that you put your closing caret on your link tag. And then now I am going to Command S, Control S if you're on Windows to save the, the file. Now, if you've installed the live server extension, you should see this button on the bottom that says go live. And when you click on it, it is going to open up this into a browser tab so that you can see all of the changes that you're making. So you'll notice that image that I put as my icon is up here. And then that title tag is right here in my browser tab. I don't have anything in my body, which is where all of the stuff on the main web page is going to be. And so I don't see anything right here. Any questions? You don't. All you have to do is resave. So right here, if I were to change, let's say, um, this to be my portfolio, and I just command S to save, and I go back to that, it's already going to show it in there. Cool. I'm go back to this. All right. So let's start coding some stuff that's going to actually show up in our page right here. So the first thing that I want you to do is tab in the body thing. This is essentially mostly for readability. You can have everything in your code on one vertical line like this. But as you're kind of going back and trying to troubleshoot your code, it might be hard to read. You could go even more intense and have them all on one line. This is still also valid code, but again, it just gets really hard to, to read. So tab within this body, and we're going to add a um, section called header. So if you do the opening caret and then header and then a closing, and this is very similar to the, when we're talking about this head and this body section, this is mostly going to be used for um, accessibility purposes. So as you start typing like header, this is telling screen readers, which um, those who have low or no vision use to access website content, that this is like a header. This is at the top of the page. Uh, this is just the intro. We're going to add another one right underneath it called main. So opening caret main, A-I-N. This is going to be where the bulk of our web page content is going to be. And then we're going to add one last one underneath main called footer which is at the very bottom. So this just helps um, browsers better understand what your content is and what the structure is, which makes it display better. It makes it for screen readers a lot better. And so highly recommend that you always have a header, main, and a footer. There's additional ones that you can use, like section and a side. We're not going to go through those ones um, because they're not um, as important as this one. All right. So we are going to use our header section for a top um, bar navigation, but we are going to actually start in our main section. So if you go in between your start and your closing tag and you press enter, you're starting to see now this kind of structure being built in our code. So we have our body and within that we have this main section and within that we're going to put certain stuff. And this just allows for better organization. And as we start to play around with layout, um, either next week or the week after, um, this is going to be really important to have. So within our main, I want to create a section that separates it further. And so I'm going to do an opening tag and write div and then close it. This is what's called a div. You'll hear this said a lot. Um, this is very similar to like our main or our header or our footer. But the difference is, is that this has no what's called semantic meaning. 
So when a browser is looking at it, it's not saying, oh, this div is special. It's like the main content, or this is a header. This is just simply to section something off that we are going to style different. So main thing of if you're going to use a semantic thing like a header or a main versus using a div is if it's like a special part of your content that you want the browser to know is different besides just for styling, you should use header, main, footer. We're also going to do one in our um, header section a little bit called nav for navigation menus. But if it's just something that um, is going to be styled different that you want to group together and there's no semantic meaning behind it, we'll use what's called a div. All right. So if you enter in your div, we are going to add two elements into here. The first is if you do an opening caret and then H and one. Now, what this is, as you close it, is heading one. And uh, HTML has the opportunity for you to use heading one through heading six. So you don't have to follow along with the rest of this, but I'm going to put in all of the rest. I just want to uh, show you how they all look. And so this is all of our heading structure. Now, if you think of like a book, for example, your H1 is your most important thing. It is the title of the book. And so if you're going to be putting a title on your web page, which you should, it's going to be within this H1. Now then H2 is like the second most important heading. And this could be used in a book for something like a chapter. You have multiple H2s per page, whereas with an H1, you should only have one because it should be reserved for your page title. And then H3 could be like a subsection within a chapter, so on and so forth. So I am just going to write um, my name in each one of these and then show you how they all look. And so by default, there's going to be some styling that Chrome applies. And so this is my H1, the most important. And then it goes down, down, down. And it's represented by being smaller. So back in your code, let's only have our H1. And you can write whatever you want in between these tags to put your content. I'm going to be doing a like mock portfolio website um, for this. And so I looked at a couple of different portfolio websites that I liked. Um, and I found a lot of them had this like kind of just very casual, like, hi, I'm Sean or hi, like this is me. So I'm just going to put, hi, I'm Sean. And if I save and I go to my live server open, I can see it right there. Now, again, by default, browsers are going to have their own styling. Next week, we're going to make this styled a lot better. And I will show you a sample at the very end of this uh, workshop today of like what it's going to look like next week as we start adding some styling. And then underneath it, most portfolios that I see will have some sort of like a subtitle, like a kind of quick tagline about yourself. I'm going to do this with a paragraph element. So if you do an opening tag and then a lowercase p, and this is body text. And so I am going to write some little tagline about myself. So I'm going to put a creative and multimedia technologist specializing in interaction. You can put whatever you want for yourself, though. And so if I save and I go to my thing, I can see that a paragraph is styled like this. OK, do we have any questions about headings, paragraphs, our divs? Cool. We'll keep going then. So before I started coding this site, I actually made a, a wireframe that I will show you right now. And so a wireframe is essentially like a low fidelity representation of what your website's going to be. And it focuses really on layout and composition. And so I used Figma, which is a UI UX design tool for this. And I just put in a place for my logo, about projects, resume, contact, have the text that I just put in and all of this stuff right here. Now, I find that this concept of wireframing is really helpful because then I can break it down. You'll see that I wrote all of these arrows <laughs> over here. So I broke it down into this is my section. This is my about me section. This is my project section. Um, and this just allowed me to have a visual for when I start coding of what I'm actually trying to achieve. I find that it's really hard when you first start coding to be like, what should I be doing? And like, how do I want it to look? So this is a great practice when you're getting started. But you'll notice that I have different sections right here that are all going to be divs. I have my um, hero section up here, which is the very top. I have an about me section. I have a project section. 
And as we start adding all of these divs in our code, it's going to get a little repetitive. And so when we get to CSS next week, as we are trying to um, use what are called selectors, which connect the styles that you want to specific elements in your HTML, if we were to have everything just as a div, it might apply styles that we want to the wrong thing. Right. So as you can imagine, we're going to have a bunch of different paragraph text in here, but this one's a subtitle. It's a little bit different from the other ones that we're going to write. So we can use um, two different attributes to uh, specifically call out this content. So if in your div, your start tag, you, pray, you place a your cursor in between the V and the closing caret, um, press space and type ID. This is the ID attribute, and this allows you to create a name that uniquely identifies this element. So I'm going to put ID equals and then do hero hyphen section. And what this allows me to do is next week when we are doing styling rules that I can not just try to apply something to all of these divs that we're about to create, but I can specifically say, hey, look for the element that has an ID of hero section and apply these styles to that. And so right now it doesn't do anything. So if I were to save it and go back to my live server, it didn't do anything, but it allows me for next week to specifically call out the section and change some styling for it. Always the start tag. Yeah. Uh, but you don't need to also add it in the closing tag. Yes. All right. I'm also going to add one to this paragraph element that we created. So place your cursor between P and this closing caret. And we're going to do ID equals subtitle. And as we start writing some more paragraph text, you're going to see that I can now specifically call out this one next week. Yes. Yeah. So H1 through H6 are all headings. And so it could be like the page title. It could be like chapter titles in a book. Um, paragraphs are completely separate than headings. Yes, yeah, the body text. Um, so in this case, we have our section that we're grouping together, our title, and then this paragraph text. In terms of how those look, if I were to change, let's say this is three, and I were to change this to five, let's say, this is how it's going to look. By default, um, they're going to have some weird styling for these like lower headings like five and six and even four I think is a little small and so this one looks like it's almost the same as body text um but when we do CSS next week we could target the h5 and make it the biggest thing if we wanted to it's just the default styling for here cool so now underneath our hero section div let's create another one and this one we're gonna do div space and then we're gonna do an id for this one as well so we're gonna do id equals, and then we're going to say about me now. So um, I will show you when we go through the next one, what that space does. So best practices don't do um, a space in these ID names. All right. So within here, we are going to have our H2. So this one we're going to have as our, we have our page title with H, our H1. And then now this is kind of our section title. So in between these H2s, we can do about me. And so now this H2 is going to be our different section titles that we're going to use. And you can use multiple H2s in your, your web page. With H1s, you should only have one. And then underneath this, add a paragraph element. And I'm going to show you another cool trick with uh, VS Code. So as we're starting to write this code, let's say I don't know like what I want to put for my about me yet. You probably just want to get something out there. You want to see, get started on the development of this, but maybe you don't have the specific wording of your about me that you want. If you type in LO, this lorem should show up. And this is um, something called lorem ipsum. And if you click on it, it's going to give you a bunch of Latin gibberish, essentially. And I like using this when I'm first developing and I don't know what words I want to use yet to um, just put something out there, get some sort of text on there so I can start seeing what the text is. You can always come back and change it later. And let's do this again right underneath this paragraph. So 
create another paragraph element, start typing in lorem, and put it in again. So we have two things. They're slightly different, so which is nice. <laughs> so it doesn't look like the same thing repeated over and over, but it is pretty similar. So we've gone through this ID, which allows you to put um, a unique identifier for a given element. Uh, you should not be applying the same ID to multiple different elements. So for example, up here, I have P ID equals subtitle. I shouldn't put P ID equals subtitle down here. It gets a little wonky, it gets confusing. But there is a different attribute that you can use that works very similarly to the ID, but you can apply it to multiple different elements. And that's called class. So if you press space and type in class equals, and then this one you can apply to multiple different things. So if I go back to what my wireframe was, I have this text and there's a bit more margins in here than there is on the rest of my site, right? So I'm going to add a class because I know I'm going to style this text differently than everything else. So I'm just going to call this squished. I'm going to squish it in. You can call it whatever you want, though. And I'm going to apply the same thing to my other paragraph text. So what this does is it allows me next week when we do CSS to target only the things that have an ID set to something or only those that have class set to something. It's going to make a lot more sense next week. So if I command S to save and I go back to my live server, you can see that I have the rest of this code starting to be put in my web page. So this is where uh, we can explore that space question uh, that you've had, where can you put a space in these names? With ID or with you're doing a specific class, no. But with classes, it allows you to apply multiple different classes to the same element. So right now we just have squished. But let's say we also wanted to have something that was like fancy text for some reason. And so we're going to call this other class fancy. If we put a space and then type in the other class name, this is not a new class. This says that this paragraph element has both the squished class and the fancy class on this. And so if we wanted to target all of these elements that have squished next week and apply some stuff, we can do that there. And then if we wanted to target the fancy ones and do something different, we can do that as well. So adding a space is essentially adding an additional value to our attribute, specifically the class. OK, so, so far, we have the stuff that we want for this section, our hero and this section are about me. So we're going to move on to this projects one. And this one is going to get a little bit more uh, complicated, especially with all of the divs that we're going to add that are going to help for styling next week. I will say that a lot of the stuff of like what to put in a div and what not is makes a little bit more sense when you start to style it, because some of the stuff I did not have in a div and then when I started adding CSS code, I was like, oh, it's a lot easier if I just put it into our div, our section element. And so I could put those in and then specifically target the section, which allowed me to make styling easier or instead of me having to apply it to every element. So if it doesn't make sense why I'm doing all of these in a row, it is a lot of trial and error. And it comes a lot in this styling and, and formatting that we're going to do next week. So the main things that I can see in my project section is I have another H2 of projects. I have a couple H3s with these project names. I have this background. I'm going to have an image. I'm going to have a button that has the view. So there's a lot going on here. So we're going to take it um, pretty slow just to make sure that you understand what's going on. So let's add another div underneath our about me. That is div. And then let's add an ID of project section, the project hyphen section. I'm going to close it out and press enter. So all of the code that I have in between here is related to my projects. I'm going to add another H2 here and type projects. And so this is essentially saying, hey, we have our H1, my hi, I'm Sean. And that's the most important title on our page. But then we're saying, hey, our about me, which is our H2, 
and our projects, which is also an H2, are on that same level. And we can see that in this visual representation because they are both subheadings at that same level and the same importance. So underneath our H2, let's put another div. So div, put a different ID for it. And let's name this project card, a plural, project cards. Encoding, it's very important with spelling. Coding is not super forgiving, whereas like Google Docs will tell you, hey, you have a, a spelling error. Um, VS Code will kind of do stuff. You might see like this kind of darkened red right here for this div. And that's supposed to warn me that I haven't closed to this one. So it will have some stuff, but it's not as in your face <laughs> as some others. So if we close it out, we have this um, additional section that's going to have R three cards right here, but I'm going to create another div for each individual card. So I'm going to style all three cards in a layout, but then I'm also going to style each one separately. They're each different sections within a section, essentially. So let's put within our div, another div, let's put an ID of project one hyphen card. And then also let's add a class here for project card. And this is where um, we can start playing around with how do we style specifically our first project card, but then also how are we gonna style all of our individual cards? And you can just copy and paste this two more times and then change the ID to project two card and project three card. So we should have our div with an ID of project section, Underneath that, we have an H2 that says projects. Then we have a section with an idea of project cards, which is plural. And then a div for each of our different project cards that has an ID of project one, two, or three card. And then a class of project card, singular. Now the note about these IDs and classes, you can name them whatever you want. I try to name them somewhat um, indicative of the difference for them. So this one says project one card, project two, project three. If you know the names of these projects, you can also put the name of the project card or something like that. But I like to be pretty descriptive so that when I'm looking back at my code or if someone else is looking at my code, that uh, they know what's going on, essentially. So in between our starting and closing tag for our first div, press enter. And we're going to add our first visual element here, our first media element, and that is an image. And so how you add an image, this is one of um, those self-closing tags that I mentioned at the very beginning, where not every HTML tag needs that closing one. And the image is one that doesn't need it. So if you do open, IMG is for your image. Now we need to specify what is the file path for this image, because right now, this code does not know what image to show when we're saying display an image. Now, like we had with this link all the way up here with an href, we do have to use an attribute. However, it's not this href one. It's a different one called, and it's represented by src. The main difference is that um, hrefs are supposed to be linking to something else where sources are supposed to be pulling some sort of content in and is mostly used in terms of media. So with image, we're going to use source. With audio, we're going to use source. With video, we're going to use source. But stuff like buttons and links and stuff, we're going to use that href because it's linking out. So source equals, and then you got to find that image that you want to use. So like I did before, I did period forward slash to look in my folder that my index.html is. So index.html is in my spring 24 web coding folder. By pressing the period forward slash, I'm saying, hey, look in my uh, spring 24 web coding folder. And then I can just click through here. I can do assets, images, and I'm going to do this project one image.jpg that I sent. But feel free to use whatever image that you want. Now, a couple things to note with this. It, as you start writing some code and you're playing around, there's two main things that you might run into that I have seen many students run into. The first is if you move your image file. So right now it's saying, hey, look in my Spring 24 web coding folder. 
look for assets, look in the images folder, and then look for this image. If I were to take this image and drag it from, let's say the images folder to this assets folder up here, this link is no longer gonna work because it's gonna look through assets and images, but it's not gonna find this file in there because I moved it somewhere. So be wary of that, you might have to update links. And then the other thing is this file extension down here. It's not just enough to be like, hey, it's a JPEG, I'm writing .jpg. If in your Finder or your File Explorer, the extension is .jpeg all caps, and in code, you put it all lowercase, it might not work. So just be very mindful of, of capitalization and spelling when you're doing this stuff. And the other thing that you want to add to every image is what's called the alt attribute. So ALT. What this stands for is alternative text. And it has three main reasons why you want to add this. The first is that if your image can't be displayed for some reason, it will show this text instead. And so if your image is like super crucial and it's like has all this in important information, you can still put in the alt, like just like a summary of that information and it will show that instead of the image. And then you can work on fixing it, but people visiting your site aren't gonna be missing out on that much content. It's just that they're not seeing the visual image. The second reason is for accessibility. If there is someone who is low or no vision and they are trying to access your site and they are using a screen reader, which reads aloud your site uh, to them, instead of reading, like trying to dynamically figure out what the image is about, it's going to read this alt text instead. And then lastly is for SEO purposes. So SEO is search engine optimization. I'm teaching that in about a month here as well. So sign up for that if you're interested. Um, and that's just basically process of trying to get your website to rank higher in Google. So instead of showing up on Google's like 15th page, you're showing up on the first page when people are searching something. And so a browser um, like Google will actually look into this alt um, text to also determine your SEO ranking in its search engine. And so you just want to be descriptive of like what this image is. Um, I think that this image, I have forgotten what this image actually is of. Okay, so it's something like a, like a reef, some sort of ocean. I just got a bunch of sample images like stock images. Um, so I might say a image of oh, view of ocean with coral reef. And then you can just close it. So um, like our link, the uh, one that we had up here, or like our div, or our div actually does have a, a closing one, but the image does not need your closing tag right here. Underneath our image, let's add an H3. So we're kind of going down these headings. We had our title, we had some subtitles, and then now this is just gonna be another important thing that we wanna call out, and that's the project name. So we're just going to put it as an H3, and I'm just going to call it Project 1 Name because I don't know what I'm going to name it yet. Underneath our Heading 3, let's add another div, and let's do a class this time and set it equal to Project Buttons, and then close it out. This is one of those scenarios where I originally didn't have the content that we're about to do in a div, but then as I started trying to format things, I found it a lot easier to just place it in a div and do some formatting that way. So now what we're gonna do is this last part of this card, which is going to be that view button right here. And so there's two elements that you're mainly gonna use when you wanna create some sort of clickable link to somewhere else. And we're going to actually use both of them right now. The first one that we want to use is the A tag. So if you do open and then A, this stands for anchor. Um, essentially, this is just the link. So if you are like, if you've ever written anything on the web or gone to um, a different website and you see like that blue underline and the text is blue because it's a link, this is essentially what that is. And it will link to somewhere else. We do need to have our href set to somewhere. We are using the href attribute again here to point to somewhere, but we don't have another page yet. And so for now, I'm just gonna put this dot, dot, dot. Then I'm gonna close it. 
And you'll notice that this does have a closing tag. So now anything that I put within here is going to be a link. And so I can put some text if I wanted to. I could put this image in here, for example, if I wanted to also place an image right here and have you be able to click on the image and it takes you somewhere else, you can do that as well. We're going to do the other clickable element, and that is a button. And it's a really descriptive tag called button. <laughs> and for the button element, let's add a class of view button and then close it out. And then in between our button elements, let's write view, not viewport. So now if I save and I go back to my live server site, I can see this projects heading that we added. This image is really blown up because it's a super big image. I can see my H3, this project one name, and then I see there's a view button. And this is the default styling for a button, but we're going to play around with that next week to make it a lot prettier. But now let's actually send this somewhere. Okay. So back in your Explorer, so if you go over your Spring 24 web coding, let's add a new file and let's call this project1.html. So the idea with this one is that we are going to have you be able to see a preview of our first project. We're going to click on view and it's going to take you to the page that has the entire project detail. And remember, if you want to get that um, boilerplate text in HTML that um, you want to apply to everything, you just do a singular exclamation point and then press enter and it populates it all for you so that you don't have to type it out every single time. So now if I save that and I'll go back to my index.html and let's replace this three dots with the link to our project page. And so you can do that by doing period forward slash, and you'll see it show up in this dropdown because it's looking within this folder where our index.html is. And so if I click project1.html and let's save, when I go back to my website and I click view, it's gonna take me to that other page. So you can see it's because I have document up here. I haven't made any changes to that HTML boilerplate. And so it's just this basic document. There's nothing in it yet. But that's how you can create something that is clickable and takes you somewhere else is through this a href equals. All right. How are we feeling about this? I know I threw a lot at you at once. Cool. So I will leave the other two for you to practice with. Um, if you are using the images that I have set, I do have a project two image and a project three image that you can play around with. It's essentially the same exact stuff. You're just changing the text and changing what image it is in this alt text and changing um, the IDs if there's any ID in there. But let's go back to our header section because I want to work on this navigation menu. It is very important that your website has a navigation menu. If you're going to create multiple different pages and you want people to be able to discover them all, you can't have them all on like different pages that don't connect to each other. And so having a menu of some sort is super important. And we're going to make something like this. So let's go back up to our header section that we created. It's right underneath our body tag. And let's enter in so that we can start writing some code in there. So the first thing is that I have this space for my logo and I want this logo to be a clickable logo. So it's something that I can click on and it'll take me back to my homepage, for example. No matter what page I'm on, I can click on it and it'll take me back to my homepage. So how you can do this is by first creating that A element. Remember, this is the anchor one. This is how we can link to other content. And you can put href equals period forward slash and then index.html. Remember, we named index.html as our homepage. That's actually the one that we're coding in right now. But you can also link to yourself, essentially. But we're just going to code this and then copy paste a bunch of other pages so that if you're on like the About Me page, for example, you can click on the logo and it'll take you back to the homepage. So then close it out. And in between our start and our ending A element, 
Remember I said we can put whatever we want in here to make it clickable. There's a couple things that um, I would recommend you don't do, like a video shouldn't link to a different page. Ideally, if you have a video, it's something that you can click and it plays in that page. Same with audio, for example. But we're going to actually do an image in here. So if you do another opening caret in between our A element, IMG for image, set the source or the SRC equal to, and you'll notice that it's not giving it to me. And sometimes that's because this is not on a separate thing. Sometimes it's just easier. So I am going to do period forward slash assets. We can do logos and let's do this full logo ENG. And let's add our alt. Remember we add the alt attribute for that alternative text. And we are going to say just like my logo, let's say. Now, if I save and I'm going to quickly put this on our project one page, just so you can see how it looks. And I go back here. So we can see I have my test logo up here that I created. And if you hover over it, you'll see that your cursor changes. That's default with Chrome. But let's say I go and I click view on my project one. I go to my project one page, which doesn't have any content besides this thing that I just added. And then now if I click on it, it'll take me back to my homepage. That's how you can start building some, like a network of all of your pages. So now we got that logo there, but we want to have all those other stuff that says like about and projects and my resume and contact me. And that's done through this nav element. So NAV. And this is one of those semantic ones, like the header or the, oh, I'm in the project page. Let me go back to the home page. Like the header or the main, these um, tell the browser, hey, this is going to be our navigation menu. Now, we're only going to have a navigation menu in our header, and we're going to just duplicate the same thing in our footer. So we're just going to copy paste. So I don't need to add like an ID or a class here because next week we can just target specifically nav, which will apply to every nav element. And we're only using it twice. And I want the same styling applied. So I don't need to add any IDs or classes in here. So the most common way to add stuff to a navigation menu is to create what's called a list. And you can do that by doing this opening carrot and then UL and close it. So this stands for unordered list, and this is how you add stuff that has bullet points. So if you're going to create a recipe on a web page and you are going to have your ingredients section, you it doesn't really matter the order of the ingredients that you put in to say, hey, shop for these things. And so you would use what's called an unordered list or this UL. An ordered list, which we were not going to use in this case, is OL, and this is numbered. So in a recipe, for example, I'm saying, hey, these are the ingredients you need. Doesn't matter what order you buy them. They're just what you need. You probably use an um, unordered list or a bulleted list. But then when it gets to the instructions of how to actually cook the meal, you probably want an ordered list. And that's number. So one, two, three, four, do these sequentially. So I'm going to get rid of this OL. We're just going to stick with our um, handy dandy UL. But we need to add some items to our list. So this is essentially just the container for the stuff that we're going to put in it. And how you add items to both an unordered and an ordered list is through open caret li and close it. This stands for list item. And so you can add as many of these as you want to um, put as many list items in your list that you want. Now I am going to put four in here. So I am just going to highlight, copy, paste, and have four. So remember before how we were doing this A element that contained an image. You can also put text in here, and that makes it a link. We're going to do a bit of the inverse for our list items. You can put an A element around your list items, but I want to show you what that does. If I were to say list item one, and then let's say list item two, I were to save, essentially, because I don't have anything selected, let me put this in real quick. So this bullet point, it's a little hard to see, but by default, a visited link is seen in purple. 
And right now it's also showing my bullet as purple and a link, which you might not want. You might want all of your bullets to be black, for example, but then have only one thing be um, an element or a link, and then each of these texts be a link. And so that is because I put the A around the entire list item, but we're gonna do the inverse. So we're gonna put the A in between our list item. And so what this does is it allows you to specify that if you're gonna put something in here, that that bullet's not gonna be styled and it's not going to be a clickable link. For this purpose, we're actually gonna remove the bullets and I'll show you how to do that next week. But this is just the easiest way to do it. And then in here, I'm going to show you how you can link to something within the same page, right? So we've shown how you can link to other pages, how you can click on view and it takes you to the project page. You can click on the logo, it takes you back to your homepage. But maybe you want to have the about section and you click on it and it just scrolls you down to where about is in your page. Super easy to do. You still use this href equals syntax. And then you put a pound symbol like the hashtag, and then you use the name that you put in the ID, so about me. And what this does is it says, hey, look into this web page and look for something that has an ID set to about me. So if I were to put about right here and I were to save, I can now see that one, my bullet point is not styled anymore. It's just this text. And if I click on about, it's going to scroll me down. And you got to remember to put some sort of text in here or an image or some sort of content to make sure that there's something that you can click on. All right. So let's add um, another one for our project section and another one for our resume section. So a href equals, and I can scroll down. This is project section, and I can put that in, and then I can put projects as the text. Now I'm going to put one for a resume section. We haven't actually put a resume section in here yet but it can be good practice for you to add a div and some IDs and stuff. So we can put a href equals, because I haven't created our resume section yet, I'm just putting in dot, dot, dot. This essentially is not a valid link. So I'm, it's not gonna show up that I can click it or anything like that, and I can do resume. And so now, oh, it actually does show that it's a clickable link, but then it gives you an error. So you can click on projects, it gets you, I must have done something wrong. Let's see what this is. This is good at troubleshooting. Project section. Oh, I see what it is. I forgot that hashtag. So now if I save it and I go back, it scrolls me down. And we have this contact button kind of styled differently. It looks different. We could do some um, kind of div work. We could add just as a link and then like try to do some background stuff with styling. But I am going to do this as a button. So you can also put a button as a list item. So a button with a class that we're going to enter as contact button, because I am going to use this contact button a couple different times throughout my document. And so I want to make it easy to style all of them at once. I don't have to do separate IDs. And then in between the opening and closing button tag, I'm going to put contact as the content. And then now when I go back to my site, I can see that it's styled as a button right here. All right. Any questions? Cool. So we've gone through image to how you can add an image. Uh, we've done some buttons, we've done some links. We're not gonna have a video or a thing of audio in our like final thing that I'm working on, but I wanna show you how you can do that uh, just to make sure that if you wanna add it on your own, you can. So if we go down here and see the nice thing is that with VS Code, you can see where a div opens and closes or where your like main opens and closes. It has these vertical lines. So I'm just going to find with this project section, it closes at this one. And so underneath it, I'm gonna put another div. I'm just gonna ID it as media section. And I'm gonna just show you how you can um, add some different types of media here. So the first one is gonna be a video and it has a very descriptive tag with the full name of video. And right here, you can add a source equals and then go and find that source. But I'm going to show you 
uh, what I think is a better way to do it. So if you just do video and within video, let's add another tag called source. What this is allowing us to do, where before with our image, for example, we're setting a single source right here. And so that's our JPEG. But something like a video, like certain browsers might like different file formats better, um, specifically with video and audio. And so this is how you can specify multiple different sources. So we're just going to put one in, but if you also had, we're going to put an MP4 in, but if you also had like different types of video file formats and it's the same video, you can specify other ones right here. And it's just going to display one. It's just going to display the one that a user's browser likes the most, essentially. So we can put source right here and put our SRC equals... And let's go find, I put a, a video of a turtle. That was an example for some sort of application I have on my computer. And then let's just end it right here. And then additionally, what you can do is if you press enter and you put some text in here, this will show if none of the videos can display. So let's say you put an MP4, you put a couple different other file formats, but for some reason, someone's using a really outdated browser or something where none of these videos are gonna show, you can put your browser doesn't support the video. And so what this does is it says, hey, we're, we have a video that we want to play here. And here's that video file. You can set multiple ones here as well. Usually, if you're going to set multiple, you would do like type equals and then video like MP4, for example. And then if I would have a different file format, I'd do the same, but change this out. But if for some reason, none of them can show, then this will show instead. Your browser doesn't support video. Now there's a couple of additional attributes that we can add to our video right here. The first is called controls. And this allows to see those video playback controls like this plus this, you know, the, or this play button. You can pause it. You can change stuff around. If you forget to do it, there is a chance that you can see this video, but there's no way for you to actually play it. So make sure that you have control set and you don't have to put a value here. You can just type in controls and it'll give you the controls. Other ones, this one also applies for our images. You can specify a height. So height equals 400 pixels. And you can also put weight equals, let's say, not um, weight, um, width equals 600 pixels. And so this is determining the size. Um, I tend to do most of this in CSS, any of the sizing and styling. So I'm going to get rid of this because we will play around with sizing and CSS next week. And then the other one that I want to show is, so if I were to set autoplay right here and I were to save and I go back, I didn't click play and it's playing this video with great sound. Best practice, don't put autoplay. It is slightly annoying. I'm sure that you have it when you go to a website. And this video just starts playing, it pops up, it plays, and you have to like click a bunch of X's to stop it or find where the video is to stop it. I highly recommend you don't put autoplay. If you want to, though, you could put autoplay and also put muted. So if you put muted on here, this means that by default, no audio is going to play in this video. So if you maybe had like a big like header background video that kind of goes through all of these video projects that you made in your portfolio, you can autoplay it muted in the background if you would like. And audio is essentially the same thing as this. It's just audio instead of video. So you can do audio, controls, source, SRC equals, I can go to my audio type equals audio, MPEG for some reason, MP3 is MPEG right here. And then I can also say your browser doesn't support audio. I'm spelling browser wrong, so I apologize. And then now if I go back, I can see that there is this default audio player. It doesn't have any visual. So two things with this um, that I have seen, you can put a video file in the audio tag. So if you had this like MP4 and you just want to play the audio and you don't want to show video on it, you can put this video file as a source for the audio. I do recommend a bit against that because if you look 
in this file format. This is the same thing. I just saved it as a audio file instead of a video. The video file is like 17 megabytes and the audio file is like 1.6. And so the video is taking up more space. And the more space that your website needs, the more files and the, the bigger they are, the longer it takes to load. And then additionally, for that web hosting thing that I introduced at the very beginning, if you're putting a lot of content on there and you might have too much content for whatever subscription that you're doing, and they might say, hey, if you want to have an additional five gigabytes of data on your website, you can pay us like $10 more a month or something like that. So if you want to keep your costs low and you want your website to continue to run, find ways to make your um, images, your videos and stuff, uh, the lowest file size as possible. For example, this project image one that we have, not great practice because it's huge. So there's no reason why I would need this image to be this big on any screen size. Um, I guess if I was maybe doing like Apple Vision Pro, um, but I don't think you would do this with HTML. You might need something that big. I would recommend figuring out the biggest size screen that you want and then like going into like Photoshop, for example, and then just uh, rescaling it down. Cool. One last thing with the media, and this one's a little bit more for that, like a resume. If you're going to put like a PDF of your resume up there and you want people to see it just right there, you can do that as well. It is not as simple of a tag. It is what's called an iframe tag. So iframe, and this is for embedding like the content of something else in your site. You can do this with websites, for example. So if I wanted to embed a clickable version and preview of like the Annenberg website, <laughs> I could put this in an iframe and then you would go to my website and you can like play around with a website within a website. It's a little too complicated, but you can also use this for files. So if you're going to put a PDF here, this is what you want to do. You still use that source attribute, SRC, and that period forward slash. We can look. We have assets. I have a documents thing here, this web coding series flyer. And then we can close it off. And if I save, I can go down here and I can see that it is embedded right here. Now, you'll notice it's really small. <laughs> You can change the sizing of that with those height and width properties. You can change it with CSS as well. You may also notice that when we put our paragraph elements, that they change their, it put like a line, right? So we have this paragraph text, but then it doesn't, this other one doesn't start right there. Or like we have this heading element and this paragraph text doesn't start right here. It starts below. And this is something that we'll cover a little bit more next week. And this is the concept of what's block and what's inline. So block is it takes up the entire width of the screen, even if the content is not enough. So for example, our H1, this is not big enough content to cover the width of the screen. But because it's a block element, it's just going to fill the rest of this with white space, where at frame down here are inline. And so they say, hey, we have this width that we need for our audio player. And it's so because this is inline, this is inline, and this is inline, they're going to just stack them horizontally. I will show you how you can change that behavior next week as well. It's a simple CSS property. Cool. What questions do we have, if any? Again, it doesn't look amazing because it's basic HTML. Next week, we'll be putting in the colors and the, the fonts and stuff like that. Cool. So two last things. So if you want to save space. Remember I was saying like, you know, don't put a video in an audio like you can, but it just takes up more space and stuff like that. If you want to save even more space, upload your video to YouTube, upload your audio to SoundCloud, upload stuff to other things that you can use because most of them, and I will show you with YouTube, most of them will have an embed code that they already have generated for each website or each video, each audio. Um, if my YouTube ever loads, let's see. Awesome. So generally, there we go. We're getting there. So let's say I wanted to put some relax and unwind with smooth jazz music on my website. You can find it's normally like a three dot menu right here. And if you click and you click this share button, there is this embed option. And when you click embed, it actually gives you the HTML code that you can put in your site to just autoplay a YouTube video. 
not autoplay, but put it in. You can also click start at this if you want to, like maybe, I don't know how long this video is. I think it's pretty long. Yeah, it's almost 12 hours. So maybe I didn't like the first song. So I could say like start at and then specify a time. It'll start it at the song that I really like. What was that? Add ads. Oh, an end. That would be, it does not look like it. It looks like it is this like source start. You can maybe try adding like end equals. I haven't tried that, so I don't know if it works. <laughs> but worth a shot. All right. So last thing I wanted to do was just show you what we are working towards as I don't want you to look at all this HTML code and be like, is this worth my time? It doesn't look great. So this is um, a sample site that I made for this project. And we're going to add all of these colors and stuff. It's going to be responsive. So as you resize your screen, it's like if someone's looking on mobile, it changes it for them and do a little bit more styling, some nice layout and stuff. It's what we're working towards. <laughs> we'll get there. I will send out just like I did uh, this week with all the images and stuff. I'll send those out as well as the kind of starting HTML code that we'll use for, for all of this stuff. That way you don't have to fill out all of this stuff and hope that you did it similar to me. If you want to do your own, feel free to, but I will send out the sample code if you want to follow along directly. Cool. Have a good one.